Good morning, peace bookers. How are you all doing? I'm Keith Belgo, and I am here to chat with you today on a topic that most of you will find very interesting. So, Keith Belgo, I'm the, the CEO of the Belgo Group of Companies. We've been around for an extremely long time, as most of you will know. Um, I'm also the president of the Funeral Association of Trinidad and Tobago, where we work in to get licensing laws and regulations so we can build a true profession of the in the move from industry to a profession in Trinidad and Tobago. We this is the first of many where we get together and chat a little bit, um, and um, where we want to talk about death. As a funeral director, for, mm, I started when I was 12 years old with my father. Um, I left school at 18 and then returned to Trinidad after foreign schooling at 22. And I've been here since 22 for many, many years. So I'm very well experienced with funeral service. And um, um, every time we go into social gatherings, etc., um, there are so many people asking questions, making jokes. We come to understand that those jokes and those um, kind of questions we ask those concerns are really of interest in knowing more about a strange profession that people always consider and say, hmm, I can't do that. Well, my family have done it for five going on six generations and we've done it very successfully in helping people to face death when it occurs. So we are establishing a death cafe today. This is the first of it. But to talk about it, a death cafe is a forum like this, where we will simply talk, where we will simply talk a lot about death. There are no rules, except no obscene language, no misbehavior. We're talking openly and frankly about anything you want to know about death. I may share a few topics just to start up, but largely we want to hear your thoughts, I share my thoughts, and we all come together to hear what we think about that. What I'm hoping at the end of the day is that we have a better feeling and understanding about death, and we prepare ourselves better. Because from where we sit, so often there are no preparation, despite knowing that it's coming because the person may have been very aged or very ill. No preparation. Of course, there's a lot of distress afterwards, as well as the emotions that come afterwards. But we're not going to really go there, really. We want to talk about the phobia and anything else that you are concerned about when it comes to death. I have a little list here to help me. At the end of the day, as I said, we are hoping it will benefit the community, whereby um, a few people will have a better understanding and make better preparations. That's basically what we want to talk about. How to participate? You just join in and post your comments. And we here, we can see your comments. I respond. Well, I look forward, maybe once every couple of months or so, We'll get together somewhere and um, when we build up a little network of friends and, and we talk face to face, maybe once every two or three months for about an hour or two. So I look forward to that when we can meet face to face. Um, the frequency, um, we could probably do this maybe initially once a month or at a greater frequency. You tell us what you want us to do. I will follow how you want it. Once you don't tell me, do it every day. So um, that's how we, we do it. So that we want to know from you, what is your experience about death? I saw, in preparing for this, I saw something that came up in the Webster Dictionary. Death is one of the few constants in the universe. But when I read that, I challenged it. But I see one of you asking an interesting question as well. I've always gotten that question over the years. Now, a lot of times when people ask me about embalming, and the question, friends, are to be asked, 
what are the benefits of empowerment? And that's me looking up at the screen on the other side to see your question. But um, what are the benefits of embargo? And the key flags that is because there's a mix in your mind about mummification and embargo, two very different things. When those who mummify, the, 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 the cultures around the world that did mummification, they did it to preserve for the afterlife. We, when we embalm, we embalm for sanitation. And because we sanitize, we get temporary preservation. So embalming is temporary preservation. It lasts sometimes a long time, sometimes shorter time. It's based on where we place the person. Did we place them in air, in a vault? Did we place them in a ground where it's dry? Or did we place them in a space where it's a lot of moisture? Did we place them in a casket that will keep them protected? So those are some of the things that impact the quality of embalming as well. But always remember, embalming is about sanitation. Because when you come to visit with us in our profession, you touch and you kiss. So we have a public health responsibility to ensure that when you touch or kiss, your relative or your loved one is kissing clean. And that brings me back to COVID, you know. The, the terrorists started COVID. I am doing my own thing, you know. But, um, yeah, in this light of COVID, everybody in a shutdown, most people, most people and, uh, uh, have understood and have stayed home. Although today, when I, I was leaving the North Twin City area, driving to South, and the traffic was almost as normal. It took me about 45 an hour to get there. Um, the highway was reasonably slow. So the, the thing about it, with the shutdown and COVID, we do it fine. Um, we have no additional deaths, thank God. And we, we, our, our rate of infection has not been explosive. It has been very minimal. And we are happy for that. Our thoughts and our prayers go up to those who have experienced death and has experienced the illness. While in the meantime, we suggest stay home, stay safe, stay alive. So, you have more questions for me? I have a lot I, I can tell What is So, I was asking, what's your experience? Have you had a death in your family? What was the effect of it? Did it bring you closer to each other? Did it push you apart? Was there an estate to be resolved? And did that estate um, have lots of challenges with, with some of the beneficiaries challenging the details? What you share with me, help me, and let's talk because we're talking together. So another question is coming in, that while it's popping up on the board, I asked a little while ago, Webster said, death is one of the few constants in the universe. And I, I, when I read that, I said, is that true? Surely, if we look at it superficially, we may consider that, all right, yes, death is a constant. We, people die, or else we would have had a crowd of everybody from all through the eons on the earth if death wasn't constant. But then if we consider many of our teachings, is that truly final? And if death is not final, then I want to challenge, is death constant? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, yes, you know, I, and the next question that you just asked me, while you were, this person was in Britain, and they were very comfortable, I was surprised with how comfortable the Brits were in pre-planning funerals. You know, that's a norm internationally, right here in Trinidad. We have thousands of people who have done that. And we encourage people to do that. There's a great benefit to that, you know. The benefits are the person doing the planning for their family. They have the opportunity, the person or persons, they have the opportunity to say what their wishes are. You know how often 
A simple thing as what color dress or suit to use creates conflict in the family. So when the person put their wishes down, when they select what type of coffin or casket they would like, whether they would want to be buried or cremated, when they put those wishes down, it makes it so much easier for the survivor of the family. So many times they put it, put some notes, leave with us notes. We even store people wills for them free of charge because a lot of times they can't take the will home. It creates confusion. So the bottom line of it is that pre-planning gives the opportunity for state wishes. One of the very important aspects of pre-planning it also allows pre-funding. Because when that funeral is, a fund is created for when that funeral comes around, it's so often a savior to families when, because death doesn't tell you I'm coming, you know, not often. Although the person may be ill, death doesn't say I'm coming tomorrow at 10 a.m. You may be considering, the person may get better, the person may be chronic, and may last a long time, but you never know when. So when death comes, we are caught up in our mortgages. In this COVID situation, no income for so many people. But when you have such a funeral plan, the funeral plan then pans in to cover the financial expenses. So there are some very serious benefits around the world, Canada, UK, right here in the Caribbean, right here at Belgrose. We do it, and we encourage everyone to do it. It's my philosophy that every home should have a funeral plan for every As we plan for weddings, we plan for the university, we plan to build a house. But what we know that is inevitable, that will happen sooner or later, sometimes sooner than we expect. Is wise thinking, wise preparation in the family to put a funeral plan in place so that in the event you're so surprised, accidents. So often we see the, the green line falling off the lime tree and leaving the yellow ones. It's life, it's a cycle of life. So, as such, set a plan, put it in place. Yes, our culture is very apprehensive about death and, um, and, and how do we start the conversation? That's what we do it right now. Tell me, the person who just posted that up, what is in your thought? Help me here. I, let's talk together. Um, tell me exactly what is in your head, what you would like to know about death, and let's talk. I'm here to talk with you. So. Yes, there is something about, because we probably, as a people, and many of our religious teachers, um, and, and the final, uh, makes death pretty final. The person is gone, we don't see them anymore, we don't hear them anymore, we don't relate with them in any way anymore, except through our memories and our emotions. <clears throat> so it, it appears that death is final, and as such, it's strange, it's unknown, or maybe unknown, but um, that final aspect of death gives us that fear, that phobia of death. So people don't want to face it. People don't want to prepare for that eventual day. So as such, the best thing we can do is through this death cafe. Well, those death cafe, we sit and chat with you. And we answer your questions, we discuss your concerns, you answer questions that other people may have. Because when I read off what pops up on the screen and I share that with you, anyone else can jump in and, and share their thoughts and, and answer those questions. Um, and we get the collective answers coming through. So let's face that. Let's talk about that. Let's be comfortable in knowing that we have prepared for that eventual day. You know, even in my own family, we are, we've been in this for five, going on six generations. The sixth generation is already in the door, that's right. 
but I haven't walked out yet. I mean, they keep trying to put me out of pasture, but I haven't gone yet. So um, they're skin in their teeth at me. But um, about it is that um, for five generations, have this wide experience with death, and, and we encourage everyone to talk about death. Is that really scary? How do we exist without the person? Something, you know, that second part of the question, how do we exist without the person, um, it has to do with something that, that we all, is natural to all of us. In psychology, it's called our attachmental bonds. Right from birth, we create these attachmental bonds with our families. And, and that bond is our connectivity. That bond is part of the love we share. And, um, and as such, when that bond is broken and separated, whether it's in death, in divorce, a solid banker, person migrate and they're gone, um, and that bond is broken, we have that separational pain that we call grief. Um, but once we begin to understand and face that, I come from a, uh, a Christian background, I know very little about Muslims and, and Hindus as well. Um, so if any Muslim or Hindu can sh online and they can share with us as well, share your perspective. But the, the thing about it, the Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. I see death could be a liberation from pain, from suffering, from distress. And when we love, then shouldn't we really celebrate that the person is no longer in pain, that the person is now comfortable? And shouldn't we anchor in our faith that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord? Then because as we see, the Bible also tells us there's no pain and suffering when we make that crossover. It's a wide gap, it also says, that, that no man cross, but except through death, no man come back to tell us about it. But the bottom line of it is that if we anchor in our faith, and when we begin to feel the pains of the separation, we lean into the memories. We lean into the happy memories, the sad memories. It's all part of life, you know. So we lean into it and remember the person. I always say, don't worry about the alcohol and all that. That is just numb the thing for temporarily. So lean into the pain, face it, talk with it, talk with someone about it. Sometimes, so, so that sometimes when the person died, there may be some guilt feelings, there may be some feelings of, of that I could have done better. Those are just we beating up on ourselves, you know. Many times we have done the best we truly could in the circumstance. And as such, always know you've done the best. Sometimes the guilt may have some validity. Um, you know, there was a song called In the Living Years. So we weren't able to close the door before the living years ended. Then I like to say, write a little note to the person and put it in a bottle, throw it out at the sea, burn it, and as the smoke go up, feel the relief and, and the forgiveness that our Father God offers. I see some more. Ah, how do you talk death with children? I wish, you know, sometimes I may bring in, um, um, while we're not really doing counseling here, it, this is not the objective of it, that we're not going to be talking counseling. We would want to talk about the, the experience of death and how you feel about death. Um, but we'll, we will, I know these kind of questions will come up. A lot of times you say, mommy going to heaven. Um, one of the things we use is that we use the leaves of the tree. 
and how the tree grows and it, the leaves will get green and as they serve their purpose it yellows and falls. Or we use the cycle of life. You're born, you're a baby, you grow, you become a young adult, an adult, and you become age, and so you have that family, and, and, and that as well, there's a time when you become ill and you pass on. Um, so we suggest to be honest with children about that, but take it in little pieces. We do not recommend we sit down a child or children to give them a whole thesis about that. Let them take it in the pinches that they're comfortable with. Because you may find you share one thought and the child has gone off on something else. We always like to suggest, however, when you see like a tweeny, children 9, 10 and into teen years, lose an appearance, that's sometimes very difficult for them. Because that's at a point where they need that support and it sometimes causes some challenges. So they are at ages where they can understand the death, they may not understand the circumstances, they may say why mom, why dad had to go, but at the same time they understand that death has occurred and support is needed through their bereavement counselling programs around the place. I am not a bereavement counsellor, so that you can follow that right here at Belgos. We have a program on. You can call for Kerrit Samson here anytime. I see another question. And most of the questions coming up um, um, are more from emotional. Facing death is difficult, but I can find it easier when it happens naturally over tragedy. And you know, yes, over tragedy, um, because sometimes when when the person has been ill, they're aged, and, and death is more a relief, and then you had some traumatic situation, accident, homicide, suicide, any of the sides, and, um, and that is always tragic. What can we do? We don't have a control over what has happened, and we must now face it. In cases of murder, Again, I suggest, as difficult as it is, forgiveness. Because when we hold that anger within us, who are we hurting? Ourselves. So forgiveness is what is needed. But it takes time. I'm not trying to deny that. It takes time to move from the rage and the anger of a traumatic situation, accidents, or to move to the point of forgiveness. So those are some of the challenges of it. Another question, can notes be written to your loved one and be included with them at the, at the yes, the commission or the barrier? Of course, we encourage that to hold that. Um, especially young children as well. I like to suggest it for young children. Um, let them talk to mom, dad, uncle, friend, brother, sister, whoever, and put, oops, put their emotions there. Or sometimes put your guilt feelings there and send it home with them, knowing and feel the relief when it happens. In one case, I know some put their, their thoughts about guilt and forgiveness into a helium balloon and, and they let it go. And, and we encourage the person to feel a sense of forgiveness as the balloon rolls. Use all those type of thoughts, it can help. Plus your own thoughts, eh? Remember, this is not just about me. This is us talking and sharing. So some of the things coming up, I could, I'm getting lots of questions, but we can also end up getting some comments. Those of you who want to add, or even subtract from what I'm saying, we, we're not gonna be challenged, we won't feel offended or anything. Let's share thoughts, see how they are, how they work, etc. Uh, this, this comment, I wake in the morning and I find a loved one unresponsive. What steps should one take? Okay, was the person ill? So that's one scenario. Was, or if not ill, what was the age of the person? 
those are things that come into question to assist as to what next to do. When that happens, if the person was ill, you contact the person's private practitioner. If the person was in a clinic, um, in a hospital clinic, then you call the police. In all cases, you have to call the police. A lot of people don't like the police coming to their home. They don't feel comfortable about it. But it's an easy, easy requirement. It's a necessary requirement. And experience of reporting, very courteous, and very helpful when they come. They will ask a few questions. They will ask what was the person's, how long they were ill, what was the person's illness, um, what medication they had, it was their private doctor, if there was none, and even if there was none, they would call the district medical officer of that district, advise the DMO, DMO, district medical officer, who will guide the police to either take the person to the hospital for an autopsy or for consideration to issue a medical course of that certificate. Or they may say, it's okay, let the family contact their own funeral home and, the, and see their private doctor or the DM come to the funeral home and visit before they issue a medical certificate of cause of death. If the person wasn't ill, or even ill but quite young, very often that um, they would want to consider an autopsy in such a case, and most times they would take the person to the hospital. If it comes that um, when the police is there and they examine the deceased person, the ambulance, that person is then taken to the forensic department for an autopsy. So simple is how it goes. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what that question is. So the police, one second, wait. I'm seeing a, um, your question coming in. So the police isn't then at the funeral home? No. So it's police first. You always call the police first, funeral home second. A lot of times, some funeral homes, and there are times when even I did that, um, that we'll say, no, call us first. And you can call us first so you can get proper guidance. But um, the procedure is you call the police, you advise them. You can also call us but, or call the funeral home of your choice and advise them that you have a death and the police will be coming and you will await the police arrival. So you can call either one first, but the po it is necessary for the police to come. When you call us, we sometimes will call the police and advise them to come over for you. And, uh, and, but the police have a simple procedure, so at that time you'll have the person's ID card available, have the whoever's a primary relative or person available at the house, their ID card, whatever medications the person may be using, you can have those. Of course, if the person died at the home where, and it's not their home, um, then it is, um, we will get all the necessary information. Now that is how it goes. Friends, we have talked a little bit. I see there's one comment. I'll answer one more comment. If any more come in, when next we get together, and um, we'll do it next two weeks from now, when next we get together. But you tell me, post it up. How often do you want me to come? Do you want me to come weekly? One hour, half hour? Um, or do you want me to come every two weeks? Or once a month? We have about two minutes to go before I've got to get up and and do some of the things I get paid to do. So, um, um, this last question that we can take for today, the spirit never dies. Connection is always there. How do I agree with you so fully? The spirit is eternal. The spirit is the power that energizes this fantastic machinery we call the human body. And when the spirit goes back to its place, of whence it came, it gives up the machine, and we are connected to the machine. There will come a time in our evolution when we'll be connected to the spirit and see the body only as a tool used by that spirit. 
that we can talk about again next time. Oh, I see one more question coming in. They're, they're encouraging me to take this question coming in. But yeah, um, so because the spirit energizes the body, that's one of the reasons why in my opening question I asked, is there truly a constant? Death is not a constant. Because when that spirit goes again, it's gone to another life. Then as such, the spirit doesn't die. And if the spirit, which was the true power of the body, doesn't die, is death real? O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grief, where is thy victory? One last one, please. Due to the pandemic and death, how do you advise families to deal with not being able to see their loved one and say goodbye? You know that's a real challenge, right? We face that challenge on a daily basis. Some families get so annoyed with us and, and, and argue with us and all of that. But we have to understand what is happening with COVID. COVID is a strange organism. We have learned a lot about it. And in an attempt to keep each other and our country safe, it was necessary for the lockdown. And as earlier said, it's so good that we have all, so many of us have cooperated in the lockdown to keep us safe. Yes, with five persons being allowed on the funeral, it's difficult because in most instances, it's four relatives and the minister because we have to have staff present. Um, so we set one employee present to assist you. Um, what we do, we will create what we call our accolades. We create these videos that, of information you share with us, pictures and trophies, whatever, and you share those with us. We create a short video for you about it. We will stream to the World Wide Web. We will send you the links and you can share those links with everyone you wish to share it with. We can Zoom and Skype to the service where we can see and hear you. You can deliver the eulogy. We just did one recently, all out in the cemetery, where people in the US were offering the, their musical rendition to the service. So technology allows us to So I'm, thanks, I'm glad for the questions. And um, we could continue posting your questions on the inbox for our next Death Cafe. We'll open up with it. But I do want to say and suggest and guide stay home, stay safe, stay COVID free. That way, we do not have the problems that can cause real national issue in Trinidad. Post your questions, post your comments. We'll talk about it in two weeks from now. Can you? Monday, two weeks from now. Same time, people. What time did we start? Okay, that's my supporters helping me. So we'll do it at 11 a.m. on the 11th of May. Hey, 11th a.m. on the 11th of May. We'll see each other and we'll talk again. Post your questions and we'll see where it goes from there. I thank you for your support. I thank you for your comments. I thank you for participating. Until we speak again.